take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, please, to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, please. 1 John chapter 1. We're going to read the first seven verses of 1 John chapter 1. We'll read them responsibly as we normally do. And also as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word and let's begin together on verse number one. Ready? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the Scripture here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music again tonight, and uh, Lord, for the great truths that are in the songs that we sing. It's been such a blessing for us to sing the hymns tonight and to uh, uh, listen to the special music. Pray your blessing now upon this special as it's sung, and that you would continue to tune our hearts to yours and uh, give us ears to hear what you'd want to say to your church this evening. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life <coughs> drew. Jesus, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven. My heart overflows the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Every need he is supplying, plenteous grace he bestows.
Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you as we come to the preaching of your word. And Lord, I pray that you would take the message this evening and make the words of the song that was just sung true in our life. That the longer we serve you, the sweeter you grow. And the song the choir opened up with that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have joy on the journey. Lord, open our understanding tonight that we could build wondrous things out of your word this evening. Holy Spirit of God, minister to the people tonight as only you can. And I pray that you would put the word into our hearts this evening. May we leave in a little bit saying it sure was good to be in the house of the Lord today. Have your way in these next few moments, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Of course, John wrote the book of John. Uh, in fact, he wrote four uh, five books in the New Testament. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the Gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. John was the only apostle that was not murdered by the Roman government. Though they tried, they threw him in a cauldron of boiling oil, and he didn't die. He's a tough old guy. And so they didn't know what to do with him, so they banished him to the Isle of Patmos. And that's exactly where God gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not the book, let me help you with something, it's not the book of Revelations. Sometimes we refer to it that way, that's incorrect. It's the book of Revelation. Uh, what is Revelation? Revelation is an unveiling. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, And so it's a, he wrote that book on the Isle of Patmos and that was exactly what the Lord had in mind for him. Uh, he, he's one of the few writers in New Testament that uh, really tells us the purpose of the book that he writes. Um, and here in 1 John is no exception. Did you look at verse number uh, 4 with me? Where John says, These things write we unto you. Why? That your joy may be full. He's saying, I'm, I'm dealing with some Christians, and by the way, he was... Uh, not that long after Christ has gone back to heaven. And yet, Christians already seem to be struggling and maybe facing some discouragement and some despondency. And so he says, I'm, uh, the Spirit of God has, has had me write these words that your joy may be full. That you might have joy in the journey, if you will. You know, everybody struggles occasionally with discouragement. Our despondency. Uh, somebody tells you they're up, uh, upside all the time. They're just always on top. They're always uh, good. They're lying to you. Okay? Plain and simple. Just be honest. Everybody goes through some things of discouragement and some times where they're a little despondent. But those are to be the exception, not the norm. That's, a, that's, that's supposed to be something we work through or we seek some, a little bit of relief from. But I think most people experience life backwards, especially the Christian life. Uh, the truth is their discouragement and their despondency or their down times seem to be the norm and their times of joy and, and happiness and exuberance in the Lord seem to be far and few in between. That's not the way God planned it to be. And I think that uh, we, we ought not to settle for a subpar Christianity. We ought not to settle for less than what God intends for us to be. And so, I want to have everything that God intends for me to have. And one of those things He intends for us to have is joy. Joy in our journey for Christ. Billy Sunday said, to see some people today, you'd think that the essential of Christianity is to have a face so long you could eat oatmeal out of the end of a gas pipe. I like Billy Sunday, man. He, he had a way with words, didn't he? William Barclay said this, A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. Nothing in all religious history has done Christianity more harm than its connection with black clothes and long faces. Truth. You know, a lot of times you, you, you talk to people and maybe you've experienced your own life and you think, I don't know what's wrong, but the joy I had when I got saved, the joy I had when I first... Uh, I came to know Christ and I begin to serve Him. I don't have that joy anymore. 
And, and people ask, how can I get the joy back in my life? How can I get that radiance back in, of, of my faith? And how can I complete, Paul said, I want to complete my ministry. I want to finish my ministry with joy. I, wanna, I don't want to, pa- Paul, I think, was saying, I don't want to go out as a grumpy old Christian. Okay? I want to go out as a joyful, rejoicing Christian. I want to end my life that way. And so over and over again, the Bible talks about how we're to have joy in our Christian life. In fact, Philippians 4, 4, you know that. Paul wrote, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Be a rejoicing Christian. Jesus said that he gave us joy. Romans 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. When God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that's peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Romans 15, verse 32. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. And then, of course, what he wrote here is these things right under you, that your joy may be full. We sing the song, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. A little song you sing when you were a kid, maybe, you know, I've got the joy, 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 down in my heart. Where? <laughs> down in my heart. And, and we sing the songs about joy. Joy bells and all the things that are ringing in my heart. And, and there are many songs through the hymn book that talk about the joy we're supposed to have. But oftentimes it's lacking in our Christian life. Now, the word joy in the Bible means inner happiness. In other words, it's, it's not dependent on what's on the outside, it's dependent on what's on the inside. That's the joy that the Bible's talking about. The, the, the Old Testament word was gladness of heart. The New Testament word for joy is inner delight. It all has to do with what's on the inside of us, not what is based on the outside of us. You know, so often the, all the world thinks about and what makes them happy is what happens on the outside. But you know, you, you can have everything. And by the way, if you're waiting for everything to be good on the outside, it never will be. Your, your happiness, your joy will be that elusive carrot that you're chasing after. And you'll never obtain it. And so there's four factors I want you to consider tonight that John lays out for us here in John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, that... That, that four factors to give you joy in your journey. That you don't just have the Christian life or run the Christian race and, and, and have a struggle and be discouraged and just kind of endure to the end, but that you can have joy in the journey. Amen? And we'll, we'll look at that tonight as John lays it out for us here in chapter 1. The first thing he says you need to have joy in your spiritual journey is the right foundation. The right foundation. That's verses 1 and 2. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That, that sounds a lot like in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about who was th- that it was from the beginning. And, and John is saying he came into the world. He was manifested to us. He, we, we've seen him. We, we've touched him. We, 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 we've dealt with him. And, and he calls Jesus Christ here, by the way. Did you catch that? We, we show unto you that eternal life. Eternal life is not in something you do. Eternal life is in a person. It's Jesus Christ. And John, who was there with him, who saw him, who talked to him, who touched him, he said, that's eternal life. I saw him. I touched him. I talked with him. And this, this Christ coming to earth and becoming a man, born as a child and growing up to be a man to die on the cross for our sins, that's called the incarnation of Jesus Christ, him, and, and him becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And he says, I, I saw that, and, and I, I know that, that it's the person of Jesus Christ. The right foundation for your joy is the person of Jesus Christ. It is, has to, he has to be the bedrock of what you build upon. 
other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And listen, that's not fantasy. That's not make-believe. That's not I wish it were true. That is absolute reality. Jesus Christ. John is saying, I'm not, it's not some fairy tale I'm talking to you about. It's not just something I'm writing about that I wish was true. John is saying, I saw him. I touched him. I handled him. I know that it's Jesus Christ, and I know he's eternal life, and I know he's God, and I know he's the Savior. It's reality. And you have to come to the reality that Jesus Christ isn't just someone you're reading about in a book and not just someone you're hoping is real and you're, you're just covering your bases to make sure that you know, you're, you're going to go to heaven so I'll, I'll ask Jesus, I'll cover that base. No, no, no. It's reality. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. He's real. Reality. Jesus Christ really did live. He really did die on the cross. He really did rise from the dead. Uh, he, he's been here, he, he, went, he ascended back to heaven, and He is coming again. Just as sure as He was here the first time, He will be here the second time. Just as sure as all the prophecies came through about His first coming, all the prophecies will come true regarding His second coming. It's real. It's true. You know, if you're... Sometimes people base their entire spiritual lives on illusions. I'm not necessarily talking about the, you know, Psychic Friends Network or, you know, some uh, far out thing. You know, about people, people, get a, people get their own illusion of who God is and what, what God expects of them. And it's completely separate from the Bible, the God of the Bible. And we kind of get their own ideas about what God is. Well, I, I don't think God would be upset with this or I don't think God would mind if I did this or I don't see a God who would do this. And it's the God of their imagination. It's not reality. It's not the God of the Bible. And so people chase after strange teachers like uh, David Koresh or Jim Jones or someone along those lines, and uh, they think they have some special prophecy or some special insight uh, into the future. Let me just pause here and say, nobody, nobody, don't let someone prophesy over you. Nobody, nobody knows your future but God. And if someone wants to prophesy, that nobody's going to, if someone is prophesying something over you, they're saying God is speaking directly to them about something about your life. And I, you know what? God said, I closed the book. And, and three times in the Bible, in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end, he said, don't add to these words and don't take away from these words. If someone wants to prophesy over you, let them read scripture over you about what God says. Because this is the words of God. God is not still... Uh, uh, revealing, revelation, giving, unveiling things to men. That closed with the Bible. And so he's, he's uh, we, we, but people are looking for something and looking for it in the wrong places. They look to circumstances to bring them joy, our good health to bring them joy, our different relationships to bring them joy, our career achievement to bring them joy. If I can just get this position, if I can just move up the ladder and get this, this position at work, financial security, if I can just have this much money put away to retire on, if I can just get this much or this kind of a home or I can get these investments to go, uh, they, they look for their safety and security, but, but it always avoids them. It always is just a little bit, even Rockefeller, when they ask him, how much money do you need? You know what he said? Just a dollar more. Just always a little bit more. Never satisfied. There's always a fly in the ointment. There's always a problem. There's always something that, that will bring heartache. Always something that will ruin the plan. And, and the joy that you get from circumstances is always short-lived because those circumstances will change. Every one of us have had uh, life-altering events come to us by a simple phone call. Boy, one phone call and whatever you hear on the other end can alter your life completely. And, and it can happen. It can change just in an instant. And so uh, any strategy, any foundation, if I'm trying to build it on circumstances, then, and I'm trying to find joy in the midst of, of life, and I'm basing that on how life treats me or what circumstances are, uh, it's going to be sinking sand, as the Bible says. It, when the storms of life come and the waves blow and the winds come, I'll, I'll collapse. I'll collapse. And far too many Christians are collapsing. Far too many Christians are crumbling when they ought to be sinning. And the problem is, the difficulty is the foundation. 
Your foundation has to be Jesus Christ, the reality of Jesus Christ. The whole, the whole concept of the Reformers Unanimous program is, is built on the fact, listen, most of the people who come to RU Recovery for help are already saved. But they have no victory. They have no joy. Because many of them, they know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They never have entered into a, a relationship with Him. Doesn't mean that they haven't truly trusted Him as their Savior. They probably have. But there's a difference. Somebody says, well, that's, that's all that matters. That's like you saying, I do to your wife at the marriage altar, and she says, I do, and then never, never talking to her, never living with her, never doing anything with her the rest of your years. Are you married? Well, I guess you could say so. But you sure don't have any great relationship, do you? See? And, and there's not a single married couple that would settle for that. Well, you say, well, you never talk to me. You never do anything with me. You never spend any time with me. You don't have anything to do with me. Hey, listen, I told you, I, I, I said I do at the altar. What more do you want? Well, we want more, don't we? See? You wouldn't settle for that. But, we don't, but, but many settle for that in their Christian life. They say, I do to Jesus, and then that's all they want to do with him. They never do get to know him and have a relationship with him. Reality. You see, it's only, only the spiritual journey based on the foundation, the reality of Jesus Christ can bring you joy. C.S. Lewis said that it's not so much the joy of the Lord we're seeking as the Lord of joy himself. That's in thy presence are pleasures evermore. That's the joy. Do you know the, do you know the joy of knowing the reality of Jesus Christ? Is he, is he real to you? Or is it just kind of a, well, I'm, I'm, I'm wishing he's there. I'm hoping he's there. The reality, the foundation, is Jesus Christ. Then notice what he says in 1 John verse 3 and 4. Here's the second factor we need for joy along the journey, and that is the right companions. That which we have seen and heard declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, and these things right we unto you, that, that your joy may be full. Here's not only the right foundation, but the right companions. He's saying, we don't, he uses the word fellowship. That's a word that gets misused a lot in our day. In, in the Bible, it was a mutual sharing. In the Bible, fellowship meant sharing your life, sharing your heart, sharing your possessions, sharing your tears, sharing your joy. In other words, biblical fellowship is a relation of give and take with other believers. That's true fellowship. We've, we've come to dilute that word down a lot in our day. But John is saying that to have joy in the spiritual journey and to have fullness of joy, you have to share that journey with like-minded believers. You see, that's important. It's not meant to be on your own. And the common, listen, the reason that's important because our common fellowship is not just with one another, but it's with His Son, Jesus Christ. I want to I be around other people that have a relationship with Jesus and that have a relationship and know Him. And so it's, our spiritual journey is joyful when we share it with other believers, not when we're all by ourselves and we're on an island. So it, fellowship isn't just, you know, doing something together. It's not two fellows in a ship, okay? It's not, it's not just uh, uh, watching a ball game together. Nothing wrong with watching a ball game together, but don't say that's fellowship, okay? That's watching a ball game together. That's going golfing together or uh, going horseshoes together. But it doesn't necessarily mean that's fellowship. See, there's, there's an investment, there's involvement when it comes to fellowship. And, and don't try to live your spiritual journey by yourself. That's why the church is important. The body of believers is important. There's so many times I've, I've ministered to Christians and, uh, you know, I never thought about it until Sam Gipp said something about it when he was here preaching. And, and you may not remember it, 
but, but he made a statement. He said, you don't realize that, that I, I'm trying to remember exactly the, the amount of time, but I want to say he said maybe 80%, maybe it's 60%. I thought it, though, it was 80%. He said 8% of your pastor's time will be spent on people who are not members of his church. And I never thought about it till he said that. But I've tried to kind of look at that since he said that. And you know what? He's right. It's amazing. And how many times I've ministered to people and talked to people and I've thought to myself, what you really need is a church family. That's what you're missing. And so when you, when you need support and you need help and you need somebody to come alongside you, you don't have anybody. You're, you're all on your own. And that, that gets pretty lonely and pretty discouraging. And then God never intended for it to be that way. God says, I've, I've given you the, 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 the vehicle for you to have companionship. It's called a local church. It's called a church family. It's called other believers. And, and it's, it's, not just, it's not just a place you find friends. It's a place you find fellowship. A giving and taking. Why is that important? Because... You're giving and taking with other people who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That makes the difference. And see, because truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And, when you, and those are the kind of people that can give in to you and you can give to them. And you, there's a give and a take and there's a mutual sharing. Not because people at church are perfect. They're not perfect, just the pastor is. But uh, just every now and then, I got to see if you're listening, and uh, you're listening. I read I read this week about a to illustrate this fellowship. There was a woman who was driving from Alberta, Canada, to the Yukon. It's a, a very uphill, mountainous climb, and she didn't know that you never travel that way alone, and especially in a rundown Honda Civic. So she set off on the road, usually reserved only for four-wheel drive trucks, and she found herself at a truck stop and was going to have breakfast and two truckers reading there, and they struck up a conversation with her. And they asked her, where are you headed? And she said, Whitehorse. And they started laughing. And they said, in that little Civic? No way. The pass is very dangerous in weather like this. And she said, well, I'm determined to try. And the one trucker looked at her and he said, well, I guess then we're going to have to hug you. And she said, no way, you're touching me. He goes, no, 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 no. He says, I don't mean that. She said, we're going to put one truck in front of you and one in the rear. And that way we'll get you through the mountains. And the entire day she followed the two red dots in the fog ahead of her. And the two trucks hugged her as the dangerous, through the dangerous pass as she made her journey. And you know what? It's exactly what a church family does. That's exactly what other believers do. They, they give you someone to follow, and they give you someone to come behind you and encourage you. And, and you have both kinds of church. You have some that will be alongside to encourage you. You have others that you can follow where they're going. And they're going to protect you and help you. You must have the right companions. You can't run with the wrong crowd and live right. It won't work. Some of the, most Christians, their biggest struggle, the rot, one of the things that causes them to lose their joy is they don't have the right companions. They don't have people in their life who fellowship with Jesus Christ and who can share that with them. You need that. That's why you need church. You need the fellowship of God's people. So we have to have the right foundation. We have to have the right companions. And then notice in verse 5, John says this, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And I think this is the third thing we need and it's the right source. The right source here, here is God described as light. That's not uncommon in the Bible. God is light. And he's talking about God's majesty, God's righteousness, God's holiness. It's, it's the way God reveals himself to us. God, God is light and he shines in a dark world. 
dark and, and darkness always pictures sin and sinfulness. And, and we know that God provides the light. In fact, there's something else that is always called light as well, and that's the Word of God. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I think in uh, Psalm 119.105, or 119.130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. Okay? It giveth understanding to the simple. So we know that the way we navigate through a dark world is having the right source, and the source of light for the believer is the Word of God. That's our source of light. That's how we see the way clearly. Sometimes everybody, we all have situations we look at in life, and we say, man, I'm not sure what to do. I'm not sure how to handle this. I'm not sure what direction to go. How do you find that out? You go to the light. You shine some light on that subject. And sometimes you've had a conversation with somebody and they tell you some information. You say, well, that sheds some light on that that I didn't see before, I didn't know before. Well, you'd be surprised when we're faced with different things in life and you go to the Word of God or you go, with another, you go to someone who knows the Word of God and they shed some light on your situation. And you say, oh, I see what I should do now. See, the word is a light. And it'll give you that it's the right source for your joy. So the, the journey's joyful when the source of my joy is based on God's revealed word. And I understand the Bible is that source. Don't, don't, don't go to all other kinds of sources for your spiritual help and your spiritual strength. Don't do that. Don't, don't, listen, this is, this is hard because uh, we're, we're on the radio, I'm on the radio, okay? And I, and I appreciate folks who listen on the radio. But if you just listen to radio preachers all day long, you'll be more mixed up than a termite in a yo-yo. You'll, or a, like I say, a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. You're, you're going to be confused because there's all kinds of voices out there. And, and you're going to hear so many contradictory things and so many false things and some things that sound real good, but they're not biblical. And, and, and you'll be all messed up. You, you have to decide what your source of truth is. And, and once you have your source of truth and you know it's the Word of God and you have a local church and God gives you a church and God gives you a pastor, that needs to be your source of truth. And you need to stay with it. Only, only the Bible has stood the test of time as the reliable source of God's revealed truth. I believe the Bible doesn't just contain the Word of God. I believe it is the Word of God. From cover to cover, every word has come from God. And I believe it contains everything I need to know for my journey and to please Jesus Christ. I believe everything we need to know is in the Bible. What's your, what's your source of truth? Is it, is it, you know, I, I'm always amazed at, at people who, you, 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 it doesn't matter what the Bible says, they're, they're quoting this psychiatrist or this psychologist or this uh, person they heard on television or this doctor that they listened to. I had a, had a fella at, who's, who's bought into the flat earth, you know, theory. But it's an unsaved man who's teaching this. Well, now, do I walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or do I not? Who's the, who's the godly man, and what does the Bible say about it? You see, we're, we're so quick to seem, you know, it, it's funny. We have God's revealed truth to us. We have 66 books that were inspired by God, word for word. Every word proceeded from the mouth of God. And, and, and we're so slow to believe that. But, but you'll go to some doctor that you just found and, or somebody referred you to or maybe you've gone to one or two times. He'll tell you what's wrong with you. Write you out on a piece of paper something you're supposed to take that you can't even read. And you take it to a pharmacist who you don't even know. And they put those pills in a bottle and you'll religiously take them exactly as your doctor told you to. And you don't even know that guy or that girl. And yet... You say we know God and we trust God and we believe this is His Word and we don't listen to it. And we don't follow Him. And we wonder why we don't have joy. Joy is in believing God. Joy is in just trusting God and believing Him. 
The Bible is God speaking to us. Nothing else in the world. No, listen, these, this is God's words. No other book in the world can say that. No other author can claim that. No other, no other preacher or teacher or theologian or church can make that claim that, that they, they are the spokesman for God. But this book can. It's God's, God's word right there. And you have it and I have it. It's the only source. It's our source of joy. Can you think about the, the, the unreached people groups that are on our list on Wednesday night? That, that now we're, we're, listen, we've had it on for like three years. And, and we're not even hardly a third of the way through of all the unreached people groups who have no Bible at all. What, do you, uh, what would you do? What would you do if you didn't have your Bible? What would you do to, to communicate with God and for God to communicate with you? What about you? It would be, be a great struggle to maintain my joy. Because I, I find great joy in, in, in spending time in God's Word. That's a great joy. Some of you, it's, it's part of your morning routine, and you look forward to getting up in the morning and reading God's Word, meditating in His Word and studying His Word. And man, think about it. If you got up and you went to find your Bible, it wasn't there. And you looked everywhere, and there's no Bible. How, how lost would you feel? See, the Bible is, a, is the right source for our joy. So we have to have the, the right foundation. We have to have the right companions. We have to have the right source. And then look again at 1 John, if you would. And look with me at verse number 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. This is the right goal. The right goal. John is aiming here, I think, at some of the misunderstandings that were circulating then and I think circulate today in Christianity. People who claim they're in fellowship with God, but they live lives of darkness. They claim, hey... If we say, what's the, what the third word is? Say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. Makes it pretty plain, doesn't he? He's saying, in other words, all their pious talk about God, their walk didn't match it. Their walk didn't match the talk. They talk about God and talk about fellowship with Him but their life <coughs> is characterized by disobedience and rebellion and sinfulness against God. You see, we have people today who say, well, once you trust Christ your Savior, it doesn't matter how you act from then on. God just takes you, God just accepts you as you are. Listen, God accepts you as you are when you get saved. But God does not accept you to stay that way. God, God can't love you any more. God can't love you any less. But you sure can displease Him. And you sure can disappoint Him. And you sure can not please Him. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, when you don't live right, you'll be ashamed at His coming. In fact, in Hebrews, it says, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Now, if there are people that the Bible says God is not ashamed to be called their God, I think it means there must be some people where God is ashamed to say, I'm their God. Hmm? There's a period of life when uh, you've heard me talk about my brother, and, and Scott's in heaven now, but he went through a, a real wayward time in his life where he was a, a slave to alcohol and cigarettes and and, and God didn't want anything to do with our family and told my dad, any gatherings, don't invite me, I don't want to come. Now, through that time period, he was still my brother and he, still, he was still my father's son. That, that can't change, he was born to him. Okay? But I tell you what, my dad would never look and say, well, there's my son, I'm sure 
but you're pleased with him. Couldn't say that because of the way my brother was living and the choices my brother made. My friend, he's saying here, don't you think, don't you talk about your fellowship with God, don't you talk about how close you are to God if you're living a life of disobedience to him. John makes it real plain. You're lying. Say, boy, that's strong. John's pretty strong. Told you he was a tough old guy. And uh, he, he lays it out pretty, pretty clear. Sometimes we're, 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 we're real uh, soft on that because people come back with, oh, don't judge me. Uh, they, you try telling that to John. See how far you get with that. You see, John's saying that life is dishonest and it's impossible. It's not possible to live in close communion with God, who is light, and live a life in darkness, fooling yourself. Your words may sound good, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Doesn't mean a Christian's perfect. None of us are. Doesn't mean that we don't have times when we stumble. But it means that we desire to live in the light. We desire if there's any time we get off track and we get in the darkness, we want to get back to the light as soon as possible. It's like the, the illustration of the sheep and the pig. You can take a, a pig and, and, and pull him out of the mud hole and clean him up and uh, wash him off and put a nice necklace on him and perfume him up and he'll just smell good and look good. You let that pig out, where's the first place he's going back to? He's going right back to the mud hole. You know why? That's the nature of a pig. He likes the, the mud. He likes the slop. But you can take a sheep out of a mud hole and clean that sheep up and, 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 and clean that wool and comb it out and perfume it and put a nice, thing, nice bow on its neck and you let the sheep back out, that sheep is not going back to the mud hole. It's not the nature of a sheep to do that. It wants to stay away from that hole. doesn't mean it never, may never fall in the mud. But its first thought is, I want out. Okay? If you're happy in the mud hole, you better not think about, well, I, I prayed a prayer a long time ago, I, and I, I'm okay with Jesus. You better, you better look hard at how you walk, not just what you say. And, and if your nature is to, to, to enjoy the mud hole, then you may need a new nature. And that new nature comes from believing in Christ as your Savior and truly being born again. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And it's interesting, he doesn't just say he forgives us of sin, it says he cleanses us from all sin. He not only just forgives the sin, the cleansing takes away the stain of the sin. And he washes away the stain so it's not there anymore. The, he can, hey, God's able to wash away the defilement He's able to wash away the effects of sin that it could have in our life. We, we see it. I, I can see it in some people's lives in Reformers Unanimous. I see it in people who think they've, they've done drugs so long or they've drank alcohol so long, something has just blown their brain out, you know, and they can't, they can't think anymore. They can't memorize anymore. They can't, uh, you know, get, get the lessons. You know what? You, if they'll ask God to help them. Hey, Steve Currington spent 10 years doing drugs drinking alcohol. And you ought to see the curriculum that gets laid out every Friday night that God gave through that dilapidated brain that God was able to revive. God is able to do that. Ask Him to do that. He's able to cleanse you. He's able to take away the stain. He's able to take away those effects if you'll ask Him. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The challenge and, and the, it's not talking about we can be sinlessly perfect or we wouldn't have to ask Him for cleansing. We will stumble, we will fall, but we want to get out of the mud and ask God to cleanse us from our sin. It's, it, you see, what He's talking about here is, I desire to walk in the light as He is in the light. That's, that's my desire. That's what I want. That's what I long for. That ought to be the desire of your heart. And that's where there's joy. There's no, there's no joy for the Christian who knows what's right and doesn't do what's right. There, there, you don't have any joy. 
when you know it and you don't live it, that's misery. And that's, that's why there's many Christians that don't have joy in the journey. Listen, God never blesses you for the Bible you know. He'll bless you for the Bible you live. So live the Bible. Live in the light. Walk in the light as He is in the light. And the joy will come wholeheartedly love God. That's, what, that's why Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And there's joy. And there's joy that comes from what's inside, not what's on the outside. Walk in the light. The journey, our Christian life, it's, it's about the destination because we're going to heaven. And, and that's wonderful. And, and that's beyond words to describe how beautiful it'll be. But you understand, the idea is we're to be transformed along the way. We're to be changed along the way. He's taking us from that not-so-beautiful caterpillar worm, glorified worm, so to speak. And he's, he's transforming us into a beautiful butterfly. It's a transformation. It's a complete transformation. That's what, that's what we ought to be desiring God to do in each one of us. Greatest thing, as a lady saying, greatest thing that happened to you is when Jesus Christ came into your life. Why? That started a process. That started a transformation that began to take place. And that's, that's the goal, is transformation. To be transformed to the image of Christ. And He transforms our lives. So many people are trying to find joy. Turning over every rock and trying to figure out what it is that can bring me joy in life. I, I sit over when I... Uh, there, there's never a time, hardly, I go to Speedway and get an iced tea that somebody's not sitting in their car scratching off tickets. I mean, people are going to buy a stack of them. And they sit there and scratch them off, hoping to get some money. And, and, and I, I just, that's sad. That, that that's, your, that's your joy? That you spend your hard-earned money on that? Hoping to hit a, hit a ticket where you can get more money and then I'll just buy more tickets? It's, it's sad to, to see that. Some people pursue their, their, the pleasure or pursue success or money or security. But John says, you know what? None of that's going to work. I said, you want your joy to be full? You've got to have the right foundation. Jesus Christ. Reality. The reality of Jesus Christ. John is saying, I'm telling you, I knew him. I saw him. I spoke with him. I handled him. John is saying... You've got to have the right companions. You've got to have fellowship. You've got to have other believers whose fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And so you've got to have the right source. You've got to have the light. You've got to walk in the light. You've got to follow the Word of God. You have to make that your source of information, your source of guidance, your source that you'll follow. And you have to have the right goal. I want... I want God to transform my life. I want God to, to continue to work in me that which is pleasing in His sight. And if I, if I have that, I'll have joy. I'll have that inner delight. I'll have that gladness of heart that doesn't matter what's going on out here. That caused John to be in exile all by himself on the Isle of Patmos and write, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Hey, wait a minute. He was all by himself. Huh? But it wasn't a matter of what's on the outside around him. It was a matter of what was inside of John. Huh? And what was inside of him is what's inside of us. Let's, 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 let's have joy on the journey. I want, I, want, I want folks to see when they come to Bible Baptist Church, when they come to the country fair in two weeks, I want them to see some people who have joy in their journey. That, that this Christianity isn't something we're enduring, it's something we're enjoying. And, and, and it's because we have the right foundation. We have the right companions. We have, 
the, the, the right source, the Word of God, and we have the right goal, we want Christ to transform our lives. These things write unto you that your joy may be full. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the plainness of John as he writes. He gives us the sources of our joy. And Lord, we want that. We don't want to walk along in discouragement and down, being downcast. Lord, we want to we want to be rejoicing believers. We want the, the joy of the Lord in our lives. And Father, I pray that this evening we'd understand just what that is. We'd understand that what it takes to have that joy. And Lord, everything we spoke this evening is available to each one of us. Certainly we all have the right foundation of Jesus Christ available to us. Certainly, Lord, we have the right companions. We have the fellowship of a church. We have the fellowship of other believers. We have the mutual sharing with others who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have the right source. We thank you. We have the Word of God. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be in a place where we have the Word of God when so many do not. I pray it would be our source and our guidance in our life. And Lord, Thank you for the goal of being like Christ. That you would work in us that which is well-pleasing in your sight. That, Lord, you would make us, conform us to the image of your dear Son. And we would see that transformation taking place in our life. And let that be a joy to us. Let that be our goal. Don't let us be satisfied with being less than being like Christ. Lord, give us that joy, that inner delight, that gladness of heart that the world may see Christ in us. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many believers here this evening would say, Preacher, I want that joy that you talked about this evening. I want that in my life. I want joy on my journey. I'm asking God to do that for me this evening. And I'm going to remember these four sources, these four factors that go into having the joy in my life that I'm looking for, that I want to be a good testimony to others with my life. Pastor, God spoke to my heart tonight. Pray for me. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Will you say pray for me this evening? Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If God has spoken to your heart this evening, I want you to respond to Him. Pray you'll do what He's bidding you to do in your heart. Start by kneeling at an altar and just saying, God, I want to know you. I want to know Jesus Christ. I don't want to know about Him. I want to know you. Even Paul wrote that I may know Him. want to have the right companions for some of you it's a matter of getting the right friends having the right people to be around the right people in your life that have fellowship with Jesus Christ that can bring good things into your life you need a church the right source some of you need to realize the Bible has to be your guide You listen to friends, you listen to doctors, you listen to so many other voices. You need to let God's Word be your guide. And then ask Him to transform your life. To work in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. To have His way, not your way. God has spoken to your heart tonight. Respond to Him. Father, thank you for speaking to these hearts this evening. And Lord, I pray that your will will be done now in these next few moments. And Lord, will this is, this is the foundation. This is digging deep to understand why we ought to be joyful. Lord, we have the right foundation. We have the right companions. We have the source, the Word of God. And we have the right goal. You're making us more like Jesus. 
Oh, I pray that we would have a joy that shows in our life that the world would look and say, what do you have? I sure would like to have it. Give us that kind of a testimony. Lord, bless this invitation time and the decisions that will be made for you. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him tonight. Have will you please? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, Till all shall see, Christ only always living in me. Father in heaven, we bow before you now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for a a good day in the house of God. Lord, we're asking you to help, help us to be workers and realize that Jesus was a worker. He worked hard and help us to have a good testimony at work this week. Father, I pray that you'll remind us to be submitted to you, to draw nigh to God, to resist the devil to be sensitive to our sin and sorrowful for our sin against you, and that we'll humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord, tonight that we'd have joy in our journey. Lord, I pray that we would know you and desire to know you in a real way. And you'd be the foundation that we build a life upon. And we would do so with the right companions and with the right source, your word with the right goal in mind, that you'll make us like Jesus. We love you. Thank you for our church family. Pray your blessing upon them. We pray your blessing on us as we go out in the next two weeks and get the flyers out and inviting people to come to the fair. And, Lord, many will receive these and the gospels on it. I pray, God, that you'll use it mightily in the hearts and lives of people. I pray we'll hear people receiving Christ as their Savior and folks calling and wanting more information simply because somebody gave them a flyer. May your power, may your hand rest upon each one that's given out. Lord, dismiss us now with your care. Help us to be about your business this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Namaste, amen. Before we sing the closing song, a uh, couple of you mentioned to me after the 545 meeting, but if you have any of the canopies, uh, if you have a canopy or something that we could use for the fair uh, to put over some of the booths or something, uh, we, we could use it. I know Wrights have one, and I think Courtney said she has one. If you have one, just let Bob know, and uh, you can bring that in that morning if you want, but he'd like him here by 8 o'clock, or you can bring it in the day before or whatever. Just make sure it's marked that it's yours, okay, um, so we don't give it to somebody else or we don't end up keeping it in the shed, okay, and uh, we want to make sure we get it back to you, okay. All right. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, okay? Let's hear you sing. Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.